Hello, and thank you for watching my top video presentation. My name is Yehel Retter, and my research question is, can guided imagery help circus artists in their mental and physical recovery? I chose this topic since I'm a circus artist, and I have a professional background in guided imagery. My parents have a college in Israel that teach guided imagery as a part of its curriculum, and I've taken several courses in it, so I know how to work with it and implement it in a professional level. Now, in circus, like in any kind of other physical field, there are injuries. And sadly, pretty much no matter what you do, it's almost guaranteed that you would get injured in some point. Take a look at colors, for example. We have around 10 available physio appointments at the circus department. They're always fully booked, which can clearly show that almost always there's injuries or semi-injuries in a professional athlete's body. And I think if guided imagery can prevent some of those injuries by improving mental and physical recovery, that would already be worth it to use it as a supportive tool. To check my assumption, I conducted my own research on the students of Kodars. This 15 minutes video is a result of several months of hard work and is divided into three parts. The first one is introduction to guided imagery. The second one is the research that I have been doing with guided imagery. And the third one is my conclusions from it for further use. Let's start with the introduction. So, what is guided imagery? One of the definitions for it is conscience and voluntary creation of mental sensory drawing for the purpose of self-change. A key point for guided imagery is the fact that in many times our brain does not know how to distinguish between imaginary situation to a real situation. And guided imagery makes use of this fact in a state which is between sleeping and being awake. It has been described as dreaming with awareness. In this state, it's much more easy to convince your brain that some of the imaginary stimuli are actually real. In my case, for example, you can imagine yourself in a hot spring that is very relaxing and soothing and release all the tension out of your body. You only create this image in your brain and imagine it, but it has a real effect on your body, and guided imagery know how to make use of this effect very well. It's doing that by putting you into a very deep relaxation, and for that, it's always performed when you're lying down, as a sort of a nap in the middle of the day or right before you go to bed. And because of that fact, almost all the time you would fall asleep when you're doing guided imagery, and it's fine, since it's very much aimed at your subconsciousness, and your subconsciousness can perceive all the information and implement it even though you're sleeping. Guided imagery can be dangerous if it's performed in a wrong way, and for that it's very important to keep it positive. One of the principles of guided imagery is thoughts create reality. If all your thoughts are positive, then all your results would be positive as well. And because of that, it's very important to always keep it positive. Although imagery is in the name of it, you're using much more than only your sight when you do guided imagery. You want to use all of your senses to make the experience much more realistic, because the more details you put in it, the more believable it is for your brain, and therefore much more easy to implement and have the effect. Now, to do that, guided imagery have its own kind of language. I like a lot the peaceful language that is taken from communication with the unconscious. This language has several guidelines. One of them is the use of the word no. We pretty much want to avoid it since our subconsciousness does not know the meaning of it. If I'm telling you don't think about penguins, you think about penguins. If I'm telling you don't think about the noises outside so you can relax, you think about the noises outside. A pretty similar case is with the word to try. If I'm telling you to try to lift this heavy thing, I'm implying that you cannot do it. If I'm telling you try to relax, then it also implies that you cannot do it, and this is also why we avoid using this word. True sentences, undeniable statements, and metaphors are meant to build trust and connection between the guide to the guided and his subconsciousness and put them into a deep relaxation. This way, you can help the guide surrender and send fully to the guided imagery with much less resistance. Future leadings are the cherry on top of the peaceful language and are one of the key points for guided imagery. Those sentences would be done in a very deep relaxation in the end of the guided imagery and could be considered a slight hypnosis. In my case, for example, it would be something like you would wake up tomorrow fresh and relaxed with a clear mind ready to train. When we think of something or imagine it, our brain responds accordingly. The more we can increase in our imagination the details and the characteristic of this experience or activity in question, the stronger effect it will have on our mind and body, because we believe it's much more real. People are also different from each other in their ability to imagine things and experience images. Because circus people 
are very visualized people and they know so much about their body, they could visualize all their muscles very well. I think because of those two facts, guided imagery is very good for mental recovery and especially physical recovery. Over the years, there have been lots of studies and papers done about guided imagery that's found a positive effects in a lot of different subjects, from helping pain reduction after surgeries, helping ease depression, helping Parkinson patients with their shaking symptom, and helping cancer patients deal with the after effect of chemotherapy. All of those studies have in common a positive effect due to the use of guided imagery. You could find all my sources in the end of the video and down in the description. And now, let's take a look at some of the research that has been done on athletes with guided imagery. Studies about guided imagery and athletes have been going on for over 50 years now. One of the earlier experiments like that was done by Alan Richardson and was on basketball players, and he took free throws as a measure. In his experiments, he wanted to check how much would guided imagery training affect athletes. To do that, he divided his participants into three groups. The first one practiced every day, the second one did not practice at all, and the third group practiced only in guided imagery. As you can see here in his result, there was only 3% difference between the people that physically practice and the people that only practice guided imagery, which strongly supports his hypothesis that guided imagery can be very beneficial for training for athletes. Those two studies were done about athletes that were recovering from an ALC ligament surgery. Unfortunately, it's a common injury, but therefore it's very easy to study and test it. In one of those experiments, they found that the knee strength was significantly greater in the people that listened to guided imagery. In the other experiment, they found that the knee was more relaxed and was healing faster, but it wasn't stronger than the people that did not listen to guided imagery. This study was done about two athletes' college students that were suffering from an upper body injury that was estimated to take about two weeks of recovery. The goal of this experiment was to reduce stress and anxiety during the recovery and afterwards with the use of guided imagery. As a part of this research, they told the athletes that they should imagine themselves training by themselves, training with others, and performing in a team competition. In the end of this experiment, both athletes who were very excited to come back to play did not feel any anxiety, and they would give around 30% of their recovery due to guided imagery. To check my assumption, I conducted my own research at the circus department. To do so, I asked all the circus students if they would like to participate in my research by advertising it through school and through Facebook. I had a startup meeting, and in this meeting I explained to them about guided imagery and about my research and its purpose, and asked them to fill in the first questionnaire, which I will get back to in a second. Overall, I had 22 participants in my research, with a few graduated from last year. So that means that almost 40% of school participated. My research had two components. The first one are three guided imagery that are specially made for physical and mental recovery, which are the hot springs on the beach, the bubble of serenity, and leaves on the pond. I made three of them so I could use different kind of techniques, have different scenery, and to make sure I give enough variation for the participants. Communication with the unconscious was my main source for making the guided imagery, and of course I made use of the peaceful language. The second component of my research is a well-being questionnaire that I modeled after a professional well-being questionnaire. The purpose of this questionnaire is to collect data about well-being, physical exhaustion, and mental exhaustion. This questionnaire will be filled by the end of each week for the duration of the experiment, which is five weeks. And now, let's have a look at the analysis and conclusion for my research, which was the funnest part for me to do, and also support my hypothesis, which makes it all the better. To do so, let's have a look at the questionnaire that had 11 questions. And those questions are name, how many times have you listened to guided imagery, and which one, and was it a normal week for you? The other seven questions are about well-being, and those are the main questions of the research that I analyzed. Here we have one of the questions from the questionnaire. You can see that I have six answers that are starting from always being motivated to train until never being motivated to train. But those answers are quite hard to draw conclusions from. To do something about that, I assign them the values from 100 till 0 in the corresponding order. And those are the numbers that are going to be represented in the graph of the analysis. Here we have the distribution of participants between the different groups that I looked at and analyzed using my data to draw all my conclusions. You can see that in the left side, I have different colors that will be corresponding to the different groups in the graphs that I'm going to show you. This graph represents all the different answers from all the different groups, and each one of them represents five weeks of answering all the questions. You can see that I arrange them in a corresponding order where you can see the most significant difference on the left 
and the less significant differences on the right. You can see that the motivation, productivity, and sleep quality have over 10% difference between the people that listen to gadget imagery more than three times a week and the people that did not listen to gadget imagery at all. In this graph, we can have a closer look at the answers for the sleep quality question. You can see that the answers vary a bit and go a bit up and down, but in all the weeks, there is always a difference between the people that did not listen to guided imagery and those who do. The people that didn't listen always have the lowest score and slept the worst. The answer from the motivation question is a great example. You can clearly see here that the people that listen more to guided imagery got more and more motivated over the experiment, and the people that did not even got less motivated. As you saw, there wasn't a significant difference in mental and physical recovery, and there are few explanations for that. One of them is the fact that it's a very irregular time. Because of corona, people were out of shape and more stressed, and probably pushed themselves much harder to try to get back into shape. The second explanation is that since the people that listened to the lead imagery had more energy, they slept better, they were more motivated, and they were more productive, they probably just did more than they used to do because they had the energy. And because of that fact, I think they were exhausted in the same amount. I'm sure that if we would do the same experiment in a controlled environment, we could find very significant differences in mental and physical recovery as well. As you probably remember, I had a question, was it a normal week for you? Because if you had an injury or did something happen to your family, then that would affect your physical state and mental state as well. So I wanted to have a control factor. The problem was too many people did not consider it a normal week. At least eight people each week said it wasn't a normal week for them, and that was way too much for me to take out of my research. But I looked into it, and they're distributed quite evenly between the groups, so I don't think that should be such a big factor. And also, it is corona time, so it's very hard to take that into an account. This is my last and final graph. And as you can see, it takes all the answers and makes an average out of them. You can see a clear correlation that goes up the more you listen to guided imagery. The people that listen to guided imagery more than three times a week had an 8% higher score on average than the people that did not listen to guided imagery at all. I think you cannot say it in any more clear way than that, that guided imagery have such a strong effect, and it's proved my research was very, very successful, and guided imagery is something that could really be used and helpful. Let's take a look at my conclusions now. After doing my research, I strongly recommend to use guided imagery as a supportive tool for circus artists, for athletes, and for everybody in general, because half of guided imagery is the relaxation part, and we live in a world that is full of stress. And guided imagery is a very simple and easy way to relax. It really doesn't take much out of you, and the moment you make it into a habit, it's just in your life, and you don't think about it. I have been doing guided imagery since I was very young, and because of my experiment now, I've been doing it every day for the last few months. I can really feel a difference. I think it's something that everybody should do, and makes your life so much more relaxed. If you would want to improve a bit on my research, it would be nice to have a bigger group of participants and do it in a more regular time. The corona made it difficult. Even though you can see an amazing results, they might even be better if you do them in a regular time, and also to have it longer. Since my experiment was a bit short, it can be much more interesting to see the long-term effect that it will have. They might be even greater. And one more thing. I added in the description the links to the three guided imagery that I made, so please feel free to use them. As you know, they're good and effective. They are built in mind for circus artists, but they will be good for anybody to use. So please feel free to do so. I want to thank Camille Cornell, my tap coach, Dr. Alon Retter, that helped me understand how to analyze my research and how to make sense out of it. And a very big and special thanks to Daphne Retter, CEO of Retter College, that helped me in every step of the way, and without her, this step really wouldn't look the same. And of course, I want to thank you for watching this video and taking the time to hear and learn about my tap.